Last time we were wrapped up in conversation surrounding Psalm 7839. So my plan tonight is not to go any farther in the Psalms. I want to talk about something we talked about last time just informally. Uh, in Psalm 7839 it said, For he, God, remembered that they, mankind, were but flesh, or his people were but flesh. A wind that passeth away and cometh not again. Now, if you'll notice, if you have a King James Bible, and I don't know how it does it in the other translations, but the words were and but are in italics, which means that they're not in the original language. Whenever you, in the King James Bible, if words are italicized, that means the translators were trying to help us understand it by adding words. And sometimes those words uh, mis miscommunicate. And I don't think that God is saying that men are only flesh. We are but flesh. To me, that says we're only flesh. And we certainly know from Scripture that we're more than, than flesh. And is flesh. Uh, we are more than flesh, however. But we do live in a physical world. And with the disadvantages we talked about last time, Whenever we say, well, God has been patient. God has gone over and beyond with mankind. And we talked about some of the reasons for that. And we talked about angelic sin and how the angels sin once and boom, they have a, a destination with hell. They're, they have an appointment with hell. And so what were some of the differences in angelic sin? And so that got us talking about angels and one of our... Uh, participants last time that hadn't been coming to our church very long says, I've never heard any of this stuff. So I wanted to go into that a little more, and I think it's good for all of us as we talk about that. But I didn't list all the differences between our sin and the sin of angels. We are spirits. Angels are spirits. Angels right now are higher than man. They were created first, so they are superior in that sense. So we know that they're made in the image of God as well. So, but how, when their sin occurred, it was in heaven, in the sight, presence of God, there was no tempter. All the things we think heaven is going to be, they had it. Without any exception that I can think of except one. They were in the presence of God, they were in glorified bodies, there was no tempter, no temptation. Isn't that heaven? No tempting, no temptation. You'll be seeing the glory of God, you'll be in His presence. It's only one difference between that heaven where sin came and the heaven in the future where sin will never come again. What's the difference? It explains what God is doing right now. What does John 8, beginning around verse 30 say? The truth will make you free from committing sin. They'll have relationship knowledge that is complete to secure them for all of eternity. The truth will make you free from committing sin. They will have been in a relationship to where they've come to trust God in his role as God. God will be able to trust us because of that relationship. And that relationship comes only through Jesus Christ. A trusting relationship. Does that make sense to everybody? Anybody have a question about that? So God found a way for mankind because there were distinctions. And whenever you read throughout the New Testament how God found that way for us to be saved, you see differences between angelic sin and hu human sin. And I listed some of those. And so when we come to the Savior, He comes into that same environment. That wasn't like an angels. He came, he came as a real man in the flesh, in, uh, being tempted sorely, being uh, hurt, being burdened, being sick. Now, his sickness wasn't the normal physical illness, but the pressure he was under, his heart ruptured, is what most medical scientists believe about our Lord as he is enduring what he endured on the cross. So he came into this world and went through all that we go through and more, faced more than us in the flesh. And those are the elements of our salvation. But I want us to talk about the angels uh, because we contrasted man's sin with angelic sin, and it did spark those questions about the angelic fall. And so I want to cover it, hopefully, in just the few minutes that we have, 
Uh, in Genesis 3, Satan is already there. I don't think many people say, where did he come from? Or how did that happen? But he's already there tempting. He's already an evil being. Uh, he's allowed to come in the form of a serpent. And God uses what he allows because of the symbolism of that. And snakes have always been a symbol of evil, haven't they? And I think most of us have a sense <laughs> that that's a good symbol of evil, isn't it? But Satan comes before, before the Lord. He appears before the Lord in the holy angels in Job chapter 1. Now, we're not going to these places. I'm just mentioning these. Satan comes before the Lord. The Lord grants him permission to come into the presence of God and before the angels, the holy angels in heaven in Job 1. Uh, he disguises himself as an angel of light according to 2 Corinthians 11:14. He is present and active in our world. He's even called the God of this world in, in the Bible. And that's certainly a, not a capital G, our God, but He is allowed rule and reign in our world. And God does that for a reason. He's allowing uh, Him to be exposed for what he really is. And if we're going to live with God forever, two things are going to have to happen. We're going to have to know God in that relationship that I was talking about through Christ. And we're going to have to have that light shown on sin, what it really is. Sin needs to be exposed in light of who God is and what he's doing. God and sin are being revealed and exposed. God is being revealed and sin is being exposed. You want to answer people's questions when they say, why does a God of love allow suffering? Why does he allow Satan? Why does he allow these things to happen? That's the, that's the overall big answer. Because he's revealing himself and he's exposing sin for what it really is. It's painful. He says the whole creation is groaning and travailing together until now. But he's doing it for a good reason. And just as Jesus is reflected in the prophets and the priests and the kings, Satan is reflected and spoken of in the major opposing powers in the Old Testament. Uh, we'll look at some of those, but first just listen to some of these things. Revelation 12, 4, where the dragon is described because he was the one who tried to destroy Jesus at birth. He's described in Revelation 12 and verse 4. It says this, His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Now you know Revelation is highly symbolic, so he's, he's portrayed as a dragon there. And it says this dragon took a third of the stars of heaven down with him. And so most people, most scholars and Bible students believe that Lucifer not only fell himself, but he was influential in a third of the holy angels falling. Kind of makes sense with the three main angels that we, that we hear about in Scripture. Uh, Gabriel, Michael, and Lucifer. And so if a third went with Lucifer, then he most likely was over a third of the angels. Yes, ma'am. So the angels that, are, that apparently are here now on this earth are long the same. Are they called mm -hmm. demons? Yes. They're evil spirits. They're demons. They're devils. They are the same as Satan, except Satan's the head he was the head. He was the one given the power and authority in heaven, obviously, over the third of the angels. Some of that, you have to kind of put it together, but I think that's a pretty good, pretty good educated guess when you put Scripture together like that. I mean, as far as the third. You know, some of these movies that have demonic mm -hmm. themes. Yeah, like The Exorcist, maybe, for example. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Damien. When I was a very young man, I loved scary movies. I don't anymore. I have enough stress in my life now. But maybe there is something to that? I believe there's something to that. I think sometimes they dramatize it and, and they make uh, Satan almost comical in some ways. But I believe that Satan will disguise himself when he needs to. 
if, it, if there's light present. But if there's no light, he can be as evil and wicked as he pleases and not worry about it. So I think in the darkest parts of the world where there's no gospel, no penetrating light from the gospel, no influence from the gospel, I think demonic activity is far more obvious. And I do believe the scary movie type stuff happens uh, in our world with demonic activity. That's what they would do. You, you let them operate in the dark and that they're evil. They want to destroy. They want to kill. They want to possess. And obviously when Jesus walked the earth, that was the case. There were people obviously possessed of demons. And I believe the Bible. They're demonic spirits that God has allowed to still be present. They have an appointment with hell. And I'll, I'll get into some of that as we go along. If I get through and you still have questions, and, I, and please ask your questions along the way, but I think I'll answer yours. Uh, in Revelation 12, 9, you get many of his names. I love Revelation 12, 9 because it says the great dragon was cast out. But then it gives us a lot of words to tell you who he is. That old serpent, first of all. So he's the one that was with Adam and Eve in the beginning. Called the devil, it says in that same verse. And Satan, it says in that same verse. Which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So he has angels. He has those who followed him in that sinful rebellion against God. In that same chapter, Revelation 12, 12, the devil comes with great wrath, quote, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Now that's talking about the end of, the, the end of time. He's going to come with great wrath because he knows his time is short. I don't believe he knows exactly when that time's going to be up, but he knows that it's coming to an end. When Jesus walked the earth, uh, a, these demons asked him in Matthew 829, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before our time? They're aware that their, their time is coming. They've been allowed out. So they've been allowed some freedom, and we know why. But they know their, their time is coming. Notice that. It's just like what we talked, we congratulated Peter for on Sunday. Thou art Jesus, thou art the Son of God. Even the demons know that, don't they? Jude 1.6, the angels which kept not their first estate, they left their own habitation. They are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. They are without hope. Their condition is hopeless. So these angels were in that place of habitation, but they left it. They were in that place of responsibility, but they left. When 70 early disciples of Jesus came in, all excited in Luke 10, 17, because they'd been given this miracle working power in uh, Luke 10, 17, they said, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through thy name. They came and you can imagine high-fiving each other. Jesus said, this is what he said to them. I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Wow, what a profound statement. Jesus saw Lucifer fall from heaven. So they're all excited about this power and this authority and wow, look, we can work miracles. And Jesus says, listen, I saw Lucifer fall from that privileged position in heaven. John 8, 44, Jesus said of the rebellious Jews, you are of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and that word can be translated before the beginning of man and abode not in the truth. It just says in the beginning, I added the word of man, but we know that's so from all of scripture. He's been a liar ever since the beginning of man, before man, I believe. In 1 Timothy 3, 6, listing qualifications of a bishop, it says not a novice. That means not a new Christian, not one who doesn't really know much about God. 
lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So you put a new Christian, a new guy in a position of great authority in the church, you set him up for failure because he's going to be in danger saying, wow, look at me. I'm powerful. I'm important. I'm prestigious. Look at the power I have. He might fall into the condemnation of the devil. It might become about him instead of about God. That's scary, isn't it? <laughs> it's true. So we need to be careful. I was looking at a study on Timothy and talking about why was Timothy given that authority at such a young age? And somebody pointed out all that was said about him. You've known the Holy Scripture since you were a child. Your mother, your grandmother, they raised you in the things of God. He was more advanced as a young man than most young men would be. I believe that's the reason why he was entrusted, because he was advanced. Think about Jesus when he was in the temple at 12 years old, contending with the experts in the law, and they marveled at his wisdom. But we don't put people who aren't that way in positions of leadership because it puts them at risk of making it about them instead of about God. God help us. Lest he do what the devil did. Now, two major Old Testament revelations of Satan I wanted us to, to close with. Isaiah 14. Isaiah. Well, it's past Psalms. I should know that. <laughs> Isaiah and then Jeremiah. Isaiah 14 and verse 12. I'll get there eventually. You are all there, aren't you? Isaiah 14, beginning with verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, above the angels of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north, the highest and strongest point of Zion in Jerusalem, which represents the the, the place of power and authority. I will exalt myself above the stars of heaven. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will sit on the throne. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee. That means study you. That's what we're doing tonight. They will study you and consider you, saying, is this the one? Doesn't, not necessarily the man in, in the Hebrew. This is the one that made earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house, in his own state. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abundance. I'm probably reading too much there. But we read the important parts. Uh, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. That's what he did. He did not achieve that. <laughs> no. He was a total failure in that for sure. I meant to just read through verse 14. I will be like the Most High. That was his challenge, but he failed. And you'll find these in the context of wicked, evil kingdoms or kings that are coming against God's people and God's kingdom. But they're being likened unto Satan, these earthly kings. Just like King David represented Jesus, these earthly evil kings represent Lucifer, Satan. Now, one more before we talk any more. I'm doing pretty well. I thought I wouldn't do this well, so I'm bragging on myself. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Beginning of verse 12. 
Ezekiel 28, 12. Son of man, take up lamentations upon the king of Tyrus. Here's a king that represents Satan himself in symbol form. And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, You seal up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. You, you had everything. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, the gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. People point out that Satan is likened unto a musical instrument in many ways, symbolically. One probably that could, could sing to the glory of God. Thou art the anointed cherub or angel that covereth, that has great authority. And I have set thee so. I put you there. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You had access to the whole creation of God. Stones of fire we see at night. Lately the sky has been even better because of no humidity in the atmosphere. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in all of your ways. From the day that you were created, that's not true of Tyrus, is it? <laughs> no, that's only true of Lucifer. You were perfect in all of your ways from the day that thou was created until iniquity was found in you. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering angel, from the midst of the stones of fire. You used to walk freely inside of God's creation, but you're going to be removed from God's creation forever. Any questions about those? When, when you look at the references and it has like King of Tyre and mm -hmm. things like that, obviously we're looking at it But is there supposed to be like a like a dual prophetic message about the king of Tyre or historical event? How does that how does that connect together? Yeah, oftentimes there can be two applications. Sometimes there's three. You got the immediate. That's like I was talking about Sunday. You had those two uh, executives under the king, under King Hezekiah. One was good, one was bad. That applied to them. They were real people. And then it also applied to them prophetically because Judah was going to fall just like Israel fell. So it had a near fulfillment. But then it also represented Jesus. And we know for sure that was true because Jesus applied it to himself. And so these things are true because this Tyre, this earthly king of Babylon was going to come and against Israel and would actually conquer Israel. It's prophetic of him. But he's calling him and liking, likening him to Satan himself. And so he quits talking about the king of Tyre, who's like Satan. He's an opposer. And he definitely starts talking about Satan himself. And it goes with all the other stuff that we learn in Scripture about him. So I think it has application two or three places or more. Yeah. Apart from what we're talking about as far as Satan goes, but yes. individual places. Oh, yeah. These are real people. These are real kings. These are the enemy of Israel. But they represent Satan. And so, just like with David, in the New Testament, they say there's no way that these prophets were talking about David. They were talking about Jesus. It's so obvious. But it had application there, but it also had prophetic application. And so David represented Jesus, but he wasn't. And Tyre wasn't Lucifer, but he represented him. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's like in time, you're going to have like types in the Bible. Yes. Like Christ type. Then you also have like a, I guess an antichrist type. Yes. Type. Absolutely. And so it's in these places that we have prophecy of Jesus. Not in this case, but in other places. And you have prophecy that reveals Satan. And his fall. 
Because when we start out in Genesis, first few chapters of Genesis, you got Lucifer. He's evil, he's deceptive, he's subtle, he's wicked. And you have to say, well, where did he come from? Well, the rest of the New Testament answers that question. Sure. Right. And then he staged his rebellion against God, and God cast him out of heaven yeah. onto the earth. And so the earth has actually been his domain, mm -hmm. so to speak. He has no place in heaven unless he's permitted by God right. for a specific reason. Right. So that we talk about the demonic world or the underworld mm -hmm. that we don't see, but it really is an existence around us. Right. Right. I believe that. Absolutely. It's an invisible demonic presence. They can only operate, they only have authority in darkness. They can't operate in the light. And of course, that's why Jesus wasn't destroyed by Satan because he brought the light to what Lucifer was saying. But yeah, we live in a world where Satan and his demons are real and they are at work in our world. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in heavenly places. I have theories that you hear me, whenever a preacher sh uh, is talking about his theories, it's important that he makes sure you know that. And it goes with some of this, but I believe that Lucifer probably had this as his home and as his headquarters and as his domain under God. And when he sinned, I believe God stepped back and said, okay, let's watch what happens when an angel rules this part of the world. And I believe that's why you have Genesis 1-2. God created it, light, beauty, and order. But in Genesis 1-2, it's dark and chaotic and void. And where God is, there's light. So God stepped back. He removed himself from sending angels, I believe. And we, we are seeing the consequences of that in Genesis 1-2. Okay, God comes back and takes charge again, reorders things, puts the moon and the, the sun and all of that where it needs to be for life on earth, for God's purpose of mankind. And the angels are beholding what's going on now. They saw the first rebellion, they're seeing the second rebellion. Go ahead, Pam, sorry. I guess what I'm thinking is if, if Satan is doing all that, we've got the demonic being spirits around us. Does God see the angels? Yes, absolutely. And, and God could do it on his own, but he is teaching holy angels. Ephesians 3, 9, 10, 11 is one of the places that tells us God is teaching the angels the manifold wisdom of God by using the church. And so this whole scenario on earth, God's using it to teach the angels. That's why in Job you have all the angels in the classroom and God allows Lucifer to come. God allows Lucifer to do something to Job. But God's still in authority and control. He gives his permission for that to happen. This present darkness, piercing the darkness, and this present darkness. And you can see, I mean, it shows, I've read both of them. I read piercing darkness, and I read present darkness. I mean, I can see. Yes. Beth is talking about two Christian novels by Frank Peretti. One's called Piercing the Darkness, and the other is This Present Darkness, right? It's a Christian novel. They're Christian novels that kind of portray this uh, demonic activity. And Cindy read them. I haven't, I haven't read them, but Cindy read them and enjoyed them. Thought they were, were good to remind us that we're up against spiritual wickedness. That's why it's important that we remember that we're not in a battle against flesh and blood. There is a demonic, satanic coordination of all this stuff. The people involved don't even see the coordination. It's not like they're all getting together, Hollywood and and the government and all these people and planning this. They're just pawns in the hand of Satan. They're believing the lie. They're in darkness. 
And so that's why we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against spiritual wickedness in high places. And you and I don't have to worry about demonic spirits as long as we're trusting the Lord and we're praying and we're relying upon Him. He won't let anything happen to us that He hasn't allowed to happen to us. And so we don't worry about it. Does that make sense? Does anyone have another question? Yes, yes. We cannot be possessed of demons because we are possessed of the Holy Spirit. I believe we can be oppressed and spoken to just like Jesus was. You know, cast yourself down. He can whisper from the outside. God gives him access to us to whisper and to speak, but not to indwell, to take control. Well, if you ever experience anything that you think may be demonic, just in the name of Jesus Christ, you know, you, you can certainly rebuke it. But just like we talked about the book that someone brought up last time about nine days in heaven, whatever it was, of that little boy that supposedly are, are grown people that have been to heaven and back, we don't base what we believe on that. We don't base it believed on any dark presence we see. We know they're there. We base it on the Word of God, don't we? And, and we trust in that. And so there may be other explanations for some of the things that people attribute to demon presence. And, and I'm not saying you're saying that, but we wonder sometimes, don't we, is this a demonic oppression? Well, the disciples came with a tough case one time, didn't they? This demon-possessed person was throwing himself into the fire and, and uh, horrible. Apparently it was frightening because they came back frightened and wondering why they couldn't cast that one out. Jesus basically said, bring him to me, be cast out, and boy, the guy was well, just like that, no problem. They said, why couldn't we do that? And he said, oh, ye of little faith. He said, this kind will only come out by prayer and fasting. That doesn't mean if you're going to cast out a demon, it's going to take all these incantations and all this prayer and all that. You've just got to believe. Sometimes the physical becomes so dominant in your life that you've got to allow the spiritual to become greater in your life. That's all prayer and fasting is about. Focus on God. Letting that reality dominate your life instead of this earthly scary reality. And so that's what we're to do. Whether it's some kind of aberration or it's some scary thing in our physical world. Prayer and fasting. Focus on God and His truth and His presence will give you the victory every time. We need to quit, so let's stand for prayer. All right? So, so Hold on a second. Changed. Is he changed? When is he changed? And is only he changed, or is he at the demons all? There's, it seems like in Revelation there's a further release of demonic spirits, and I think it coincides with sin and its presence in our world. So whether that's just purely symbolic, but I think the chains are that they're under... God's thumb, that God is allowing it, but the moment God speaks, they're going to be gone. That they know they have this appointment. So they're on a chain gang, basically. It wouldn't be like during the tribulation or during the thousand year reign. Well, in Revelation, it says during the tribulation period, there will be great hordes come out of hell. So I don't know if that's purely symbolic, I think it's probably a further release of demonic spirits on the earth. So they're under his control, just like Satan had to come and ask permission to attack Job. He can't just do it on his own authority. So, again, that, that chaining is, is limited. Yes. So, like you just spoke of, it's God allowing it to happen. Mm -hmm. So what, what am I, I'm, I'm, there's a restriction if I'm under chains. So they're limited by time. They're limited by space. Satan may be the prince of the power of the air, mm -hmm. but I don't believe he's omnipresent. No. He's limited. Yeah. He can be in eight place. And to give him the to give him the benefit of the doubt to say that, oh, he can do all these things. Like, no, he, he gets the access by which God grants. Right. That's it. And, and Satan's tactics and schemes and methods is not to grow darkness. It's to, to extinguish the light, right, or diminish. Light. And I've shared it with the youth. If I go outside and get a giant 32-ounce cup and capture some of that darkness and come in here and run in and go, I caught it, and I open it up, it's not going to get any darker in here. Mm -mm. I 
I can't pour darkness into this place. But what happens if I remove light from this place? Mm -hmm. It will get dark. Right, exactly. And light, physical light is a symbol of spiritual light. Right. It's, it's a like great people illustration. Like, people have, have questioned, Pastor, well, well, you know, even young people, what if, what if a demonic force would come and, and, and want to enter? Well, no, because you are light. You scatter darkness. The presence of Christ in your life, I have nothing to fear. Right. Because Amen. It can't be poured into me. It is Christ's light dispelling the darkness. Away. That's right. Amen. Amen. Preach it, brother. <laughs> All right. Well, let's stand for prayer. Lord, thank you for these reminders so uh, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against the rulers of the darkness, as Andrew has so eloquently put it just now. And the only way that we can fight this battle is with light, and the only source of light is you. And thank you, Father, that you have come into our hearts. You have brought light into us. And all we have to do is embrace the light, trust the light, let the light grow in us. And we have nothing to fear. And yeah, some bad things happen in this world. But say, uh, Jesus said, don't fear, I've overcome the world. And we will overcome by your word, by trusting you, by the presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for that reminder tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.